Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you uh, to the organizers of Games for Change for having uh, me back to spend a little bit of time with you. I look forward to speaking for about 20 minutes, and then uh, look forward to your questions. So if you have things that you'd like to, uh, to raise, or that there's any of the material you have any questions about, please do feel free to uh, save those, and we'll have a little time at the end. Um, and I think I'm very excited over the past couple of days uh, to listen to the experts in our industry who are doing some of the most remarkable work to improve our lives and society through the magic of our medium of video games. It's an industry that I'm uh, enormously honored to represent, and the ESA is an organization that I'm even more privileged to lead, and it comes down to the creative energy of, uh, of the engine that is the entertainment part of the industry that drives us but we see these other aspects of the industry, the promise of technology, and it's led by individuals like yourselves and the groups you represent, and it's a privilege to share the, the, these days with you here in New York and in the good care of the Games for Change team. Um, for an industry as dynamic as ours, a lot can change in a short period of time. And since I last was here three years ago, our industry has continued its remarkable evolution, inclu including introducing innovative new entertainment experiences and chartering unprecedented leaps in technology. Amid these uh, changes and the backdrop of an ever-expanding player base, it has never been clearer that video games have tremendous potential to stimulate social change. In fact, when you look at the industry itself, we've grown to 146,000 employees, that's direct and indirect nationwide, um, and that growth is driven by the presence of the industry across every device, which has a screen and a battery, as well as the introduction of three new consoles, which have all are cloud-based and all drive remarkable entertainment experiences. That employment and revenue growth in our industry, 10% per year, is four times bigger than the growth rate of the United States economy. So when you look at the industry and you look at its health, it's never been more vibrant, it's never been more connected to consumers, as we'll, we'll touch on in a moment. But as we know, video games are much more than just pure entertainment. They're at the forefront of education and digital learning and workforce training and recruitment. And they drive the technological innovation that will make companies smarter, faster, and more competitive. Now, I go to other conferences around the country and they speak of the Internet of Things. I really believe that for our industry, it's the Internet of Experiences. What really brings value to consumers is the, are the connections they make and the things that they do. It's not the devices themselves, and at the very top of that hierarchy are video games. And that magical engagement, that immersion, that entertainment, and that growth that comes from playing them. And today I'll share the highlights of the industry's revolution, uh, evolution and discuss how we can all continue to work together to expand video games' positive influence on all areas of daily life. And given what we have achieved so far, I believe that the future is quite bright. So, over the last 40 years, all right, there we go. Over the past 40 years, entertainment software has experienced tremendous growth. What started with Pong and 8-bit plumbers has transformed into visually stunning masterpieces featuring fantasy worlds and simulated real-life environments rendered in such incredible detail that players feel almost as if they're in the game. And with the advent of virtual reality, which has been um, uh, discussed and, and, and now is about ready for consumer enjoyment, we look to see that frontier extended even further where players are actually in the game. Other advances, especially those in wireless technology, broadband connectivity, streaming services, and cloud computing, now allow consumers to access games and entertainment content across every device with a screen giving on-demand on gameplay a whole new meaning. As these new platforms have, aver have emerged, the variety of games has expanded. Game genres and business models have multiplied and now exist that didn't exist two, three, or four years ago. And they're pushing our industry to new heights. Standouts in these genres, such as Clash of Clans, the current highest grossing mobile game, make more than a million dollars every day. And in recognition of that, ESA is, is seeing the growth in the mobile market and the worldwide nature of it, the digital connected um, environment that it is, uh, worked with the ESRB to create 
the International Age Rating Council, which is a, a platform worldwide that's used for rating games on mobile, because we all know how important that is. It's important for parents, it's important for consumers, it's important for a number of governments who take interest in this. And uh, that development, of, or that, that platform, was just announced a month ago as going to be adopted by Google's Android store. And Pat Vance, if she's here, uh, should raise her hand. She's right over here. Congratulations to Pat for that. But the uh, video game technology has also spurred the growth of entirely new sporting events, or eSports. And the notion that 27 million people would tune in to the League of Legends Season 3 World Championship is remarkable. 27 million people, to put that in perspective, that's more than watched the series finale of Breaking Bad, 24, and The Sopranos combined. And that shows the power of the audience that is um, immersed in the magic that's created this entertainment experience. And nearly 100 million users, gamers, tune into Twitch um, uh, once a month. The average view time is nearly two hours. Again, the engagement level for our medium has never been higher than it is today. Um, and each move has pushed our industry to be more expansive and interconnected. Once limited to just one or two players, Game platforms now allow thousands to play and to connect simultaneously. And according to ESA's 2015 essential facts about the computer and video game industry, which we released earlier this month, 56% of the most frequent gamers play with others, and 54% play online in multiplayer mode at least weekly. So these technological and artistic enhancement drive demand for cutting edge entertainment. Computer and video game play has grown to become a universal experience. More than one billion people play games worldwide today. And as our industry has developed more innovative games and game technologies, our audience has broadened and matured and diversified significantly. And this trajectory that we're on is only going to be better as we look to the growth of the smartphone market. In the next 18 months, there will be one billion new gamers added to the billion that already exist through the growth of and distribution of smartphone technology by the wireless industry. Very powerful component and, and accelerant for growth. Now according to, again, to our essential facts here in the US, nearly half of the population, 155 million people, play video games and four out of five American households own a device used for gameplay. And these players are diverse. There are twice as many adult female gamers as young male players, those under 17. And the most frequent female game play gamer is on average 43 years old. Additionally, players age 50 and older are the second largest segment of the gaming population. So the power of, that we have in the diversity of our consumer base has, is, is fantastic and it's never been higher. But as we know, especially as we gather here, the evolution of our industry and the popularity, popu popularity of play across platforms and demographics has in turn prompted video games integration into our daily lives. They're now ingrained in our culture. Entertainment software is uniquely positioned to drive positive change to truly transform our lives. And it's not, again, not news to anyone here. Almost all of you in this room have done outstanding work to apply games, game principles, and game technologies to field, fields outside of entertainment to find answers to creative social challenges. And as you know, video games are now valuable tools that strengthen our education system, improve the delivery of healthcare, increase our chances for workplace success, and tackle important social issues. At ESA, we're confident that your continued efforts will advance these important trends even further. Now, at ESA, we proudly celebrated our 20th anniversary last year, marking two decades of success in representing the US video game industry. Among the accomplishments in which we take great pride are the quality partnerships we have built with nonprofit organizations, issue experts, and state and federal policymakers to strengthen video game uh, industry's impact and the impact of gamers and to preserve the runway and the growth rate for exciting new technologies. We're particularly interested in the intersection of games and education and collaborate with our partners to support and promote video game use in the classroom. And just yesterday, we partnered with the Department of Education and Games for Change to launch the first Games for Learning Summit here in New York City. 
This day-long summit brought together leading developers, publishers, policymakers, educators, and students to identify strategies on how to better create, distribute, and use quality educational games both in and outside of the classroom. And I think it was particularly powerful at the conference yesterday that we've arrived, we've, we've moved beyond the notion that video games can be impactful in education. The fact is that they are in multiple places in cl classrooms across the country using many different platforms and innovative ideas, again, many represented in this room. The fact is true. Our task is now to grow the understanding, the realization, and the impact of that truth. So we've also co collaborated with the Institute of Play, Electronic Arts, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create the Games Learning and Assessment Lab, or GLASS Lab. And this groundbreaking video game design lab has built and released nine different video games, uh, which have uh, been now in 5,000 classrooms and have, have had over 10 million play sessions. Again, this is an idea that three years ago was born, was announced uh, 18 months ago, and in the course of the last year has achieved that level of penetration. And again, I think that speaks to the power of digital platforms. It speaks to the power of video games as a teaching medium. Additionally, we continue to support the National STEM Video Game Challenge, which is an annual game design competition that challenges students and developers to create original games that stimulate interest in STEM subjects. Now this year, we added some new partners, and we added the Regional Spotlight Program, which this year is again focused in the Pittsburgh area. We added a series of workshops on exploring the power of intergenerational play and design. That's with our colleagues at, the, at ARP. And we look forward to announcing our 2015 challenge winners in June. When this effort first began, uh, led by Michael Levine and the team here at Sesame Street in New York, when the effort first began, we had 400 applicants where the kids that designed the games, they were, again, acting as creators, not just consumers of the great content. We had 400 applicants. Last year, we had over 4,000. So again, the reach and the excitement around our medium is very potent up and down the age chain. So finally, we're helping women and minorities begin their path to prof professional success in our industry through the ESA Loft Video Game Innovation Fellowship. It's a partnership with the Hispanic Heritage Foundation's Leaders on the Fast Track, or Loft program. The fellowship awards 20 minority youths with grants to design and program their own video games that aim towards solving problems in their communities. Then the fellows travel to Washington, D.C., and we escort them in meetings on Capitol Hill and with the White House. And again, it's a very positive and exciting time for those young uh, developers that are in making. So these and other initiatives are imparting complex knowledge and developing crucial STEM skill sets among students while reinforcing positive educational habits and lessons learned. The ESA Foundation um, is another arm that we use, to, the industry uses, to support your work and that of your colleagues through our philanthropic arm. Since its inception in 2000, the foundation has provided millions of dollars to support innovative and diverse projects that harness the power of computer and video game technology to create social impact. The ESA Foundation's core grant program supports charitable organizations and schools that leverage entertainment software and technology to create meaningful opportunities for America's youth. Each year, our grants help connect youth to educational computer and video games, contribute to a more digitally advanced generation, and these programs we support help reinforce math and science skills, enliven history, increase civic participation, improve health outcomes, and prepare students for college. For example, the ESA Foundation grantee iCivics, which was founded by the former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, created a game-based learning platform to help teach civics. First launched in 2009, iCivics now features 21 games about constitutional law and the branches of the U.S. government, each of which also comes with suggested lesson plans that are tailored to meet state-specific learning standards. In January, we proudly partnered with iCivics to launch DBQuest, Eyes on the Prize, a first-of-its-kind online platform that teaches students about the civil rights movement. And it improves their students' argumentative writing and uh, critical reading skills along the way. 
We hosted a special event in Washington, D.C. with Justice O'Connor to celebrate the launch, and I was incredibly energized by her charge that as far as iCivics has come, as far as its reach has grown, as many middle school classrooms as it's penetrated, it's still not enough. And it won't be enough until all of them are and until we have a generation of new citizens that are ready to take on the burdens and responsibility of citizenship. And her energy is, um, is quite apparent in the iCivics organization and we are proud to partner with them. Another ESA Foundation grantee, Hope Lab, seeks to improve children's lives with its innovative and educational digital resources. The ESA Foundation provided Hope Lab with grants from 2008 to 2014 to support its development of Remission and Remission 2, um, which are video games which promote successful long-term treatment outcomes for adolescents and young adults with cancer. The games are designed to motivate players to basically stick to their treatment and to see the value of, 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 the, of the challenges that they're facing and through playing the game, reach a better result than they would otherwise. And the results have been um, chronicled in numerous medical journals and it's been, again, another very exciting partnership, very positive. And we're pleased this year that Hope Lab received a grant for its development and testing of ZAMZ, a physical activity tracker that encourages children and families to pursue healthy lifestyles. This year, the ESA Foundation is also providing funding to Vision Quest 2020, which is leveraging educational technology to establish a nationwide vision screening program for school children across the United States. Its newest screening system, an interactive game called iSpy 2020, is the only screening system that tests visual acuity, depth perception, and color vision. Our grant will help provide game software and related supplies and trainings to more than 30 schools to enable them to conduct unlimited vision screenings. This slide reflects all of the ESA Foundation's 2015 grantees whose projects are well underway. We look forward to seeing the results of their efforts later this year and encourage any of you who are interested to apply for a grant. The ESA Foundation is accepting submissions for its 2016 grant program through May 15, and the application and everything you need for information is on the ESA Foundation website. So of course, um, support for your work does not end with these programs. As you may know, ESA is based in Washington, D.C., and because of that, we have access to policymakers, opinion leaders, and, uh, and that access enables us to tell the story of how games are improving what matters to a very influential audience. We achieve this in part through the relationship with the Congressional Caucus for Competitiveness in Entertainment Technology, or the ETEC Caucus. ESA worked with U.S. Representative Kevin Brady and Debbie Wasserman Schultz to launch the caucus in February 2011, and it now boasts more than 50 bipartisan members, and the caucus works to educate policymakers and the public about the economic, educational, and social benefits of entertainment technology. We frequently share examples of your work with these lawmakers and other audiences to demonstrate the positive impacts that video games can have on the way we live, learn, and work, and how to further interest in developing new and innovative applications for interactive entertainment software. So video games have proven their value in making an economic impact in the world, and as a result, we see a growing acceptance of video games as more than just an entertainment medium. There's always more we can do to increase this recognition. And at ESA, we want to work with you to enhance understanding among policymakers, educators, healthcare providers, and nonprofit organizations, business leaders, on how video games can help Americans lead healthier, happier, and more productive lives. We want to amplify your voice and tell the stories of how your innovations are changing our society. We're always interested in forging new partnerships. So on behalf of ESA, I congratulate you on your accomplishments and your achievements. We welcome the opportunity to work with you, and together we can leverage our creative strengths and shape our country's future. I'm now happy to take your questions. And I'll look out in the audience and see if you raise a hand, I'll point. 
wow, this is an easy group or it's late in the afternoon, one or the other. Right up here, or there's two here, but first the one in the back, gentlemen. Can't see quite, sorry, lights. It, it's Zach. Hey, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Um, you started out by saying that there are 146,000 jobs in the game industry, and you talked about 44% of the game players out there being women. I don't suppose that 44% of the workforce is women. I thought it was very telling that you talked about the ESA as, as part of its direct influence, attempting to create scholarships or opportunities for 20 uh, young people of color or women. By my calculations, about 64,420 jobs that are required for that demographic, and 20 is a great drop in the bucket, but what is the ESA's role or responsibility in bringing its member companies, the large glut of the employers in the industry, in, out of the 1950s and, you know, less, less male and less whitewashed. Thanks for the question, Zach. And somehow I anticipated that this subject would come up. Um, ESA's uh, uh, role in this goes much beyond the uh, Loft Fellowship that I referenced. That's just simply one program. Through the ESA Foundation, we give out 30 scholarships a year to women and minority students to assist them in reaching their college dreams. And that's just one of the scholarship programs. Another scholarship program we have operates with teachers to make sure that they're enabled to provide tools that are innovative in the classroom. That's the Challenge Grant Program. We're also pleased to provide those tools and those resources to teachers. So we work with uh, the industry to make sure that we are reaching out to those communities where there's a need to bring diversity, to bring those interests better represented into the industry. Now I believe according to IGDA, the number for female representation in the industry is actually at 22%. While that's substantially ahead of the tech industry overall, which is around 15%, we still have a long way to go and we know it. Um, and uh, we're particularly encouraged by the research that was recently revealed, uh, released by the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, that looked at the pipeline for talent. Where's the new talent gonna come from to fill these jobs in our industry as we continue to grow? And what that study says, says two very important facts, as many things, but the two that are most important to this question. One is that a third of that pipeline is women. Now, while it would be ideal that we could be at 50%, and I say that as a father of two daughters who are engineers, I'm personally very familiar with uh, what it takes to have a strong STEM philosophy in the home and to, and, and to stimulate um, both my son and my daughters to reach those high goals. 33% is twice as high as the female enrollment that are in the engineering programs and the computer science programs in 63 different universities that participated in that study. So we're quite encouraged by what we see as the pipeline of fantastic talent that will be coming our direction and we're ready to receive them into the industry to create these dynamic experiences that we all enjoy. So I, I think, that I, I know, I know every ESA member is committed to diversity in the workplace and in the marketplace. We're proud to represent that viewpoint. We have a long way to go. We look forward to working with you to get there. Another question. No, thank you. <laughs> Another question. It's always fun to start with the easy ones. <laughs> right here. Um, I'm interested to know a little bit more about how you measure impact and um, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, how many of your projects you would deem successful. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, on impact, um, we're, we're relatively uh, modest. We want to be a key contributor to what's a larger goal. So if you look in, at the different universities that we've contributed to, it's to be a catalyst for something that continues and survives. Um, or the museums, we support uh, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the Museum of the Moving Image, uh, the Smithsonian, we have different grant sizes that we've worked on there. We've given over three quarters of a million dollars in scholarships to Thanks USA. These are scholarships that principally go to the, um, the children of our troops that are protecting our freedom abroad. And so I'd say that in the scholarship realm, definitely feel high impact because each one of those minds that we're able to influence and help along the way, that's a positive for the industry that uh, is undeniable. Um, and we're hopeful that they're all completing their education. We don't monitor them necessarily along the way. We're pleased to help them when they ask for help. Um, and on some of the grants, 
some of the grants are very exciting. They end up um, uh, with like Hope Lab and the ones that I highlight in my remarks. There's no question about their success. It's really remarkable what we're able to be a partner in assisting others in achieving. Others, I think, uh, and, and we, others is too soon to tell. This last year, uh, we reached out to the Girl Scouts and uh, in Los Angeles through Eline Ventures, we instituted a badging program for, for young girls that, to, to, that they can get by writing video games, by playing games, that they get one of their badges is for video game uh, experience and coding. That's terrific, it's one year, it's a little early to tell. And so I think on some of those programs that they're not quite as impactful because it happens and then it just dissipates and we don't necessarily see results. But we always have our eyes open and we do keep in touch. And as you can see from the history on the ESA Foundation website, there are some repeat grantees and those repeats only happen when we see results. Good question. Another one? Up in the way back, there's two people. Let's go with the gentleman in the blue vest. I think it's a gentleman, sorry. Right. Hi, uh, so back in October, a spokesperson for the ESA said, uh, threats of violence and harassment are wrong, they have to stop. There's no place in the video game community uh, or our society for personal attacks or threats. And so that was back in October, and I wanna know what is the ESA doing concretely in an actual, you know, outside of just vague terms to combat the harassment that's plaguing our industry right now? Well, it's important to understand the role of a trade association in this, and that's, uh, we're not law enforcement. Um, what we do is we convene um, uh, and have discussions with leaders and other industry groups, and I think when you see uh, companies like Twitter changing their policies about harassment and the language that's used, um, that, 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 and putting in some steps to mitigate that, I think that's positive. And I think when our voice is added to others that say this, uh, this activity is not condoned, I think that's very positive. You have a number of, um, of interest in working with law enforcement to try and track down the people who are making these threats. We stand four square with those efforts and believe that they're very important because this harassment issue is not a uniquely video game issue. It is in this one circumstance focused um, in, in our environment, but if you look, if you just simply put in um, harassment on the internet into your search browser of choice, mine's Bing because Microsoft is a member, um, uh, if, um, <laughs> If, if, you, if you do that, you'll get back instances that span across the use of the internet. It's not uniquely our challenge, but we do stand with others who want to see the threats end, the harassment end, and for civil discourse, we protect the First Amendment. That's one of the things ESA is known best for. We support the speaker, all speakers' rights, including those who are critical, and, and that this type of activity is just flat wrong and needs to stop. So we've been clear about that. We'll continue to be clear about it. <laughs> Thank you. No, right down here in front. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Excellent question. The question is about the worldwide impact of these things. And with the focus of ESA, are we purely United States or is, are we broader than that? And then what's being done with our colleagues around the world to make sure there's some coordination? I believe I got the question right. Okay, very good. So um, uh, we are the U.S. Trade Association representing the video game industry. Our reach really expands uh, through North America. We partner very closely with ESA Canada. We also work on ratings issues in Mexico. We have a couple of issues that we manage in South America, uh, but principally our focus is here in North America. But we're quite aware, and the point of the question is right on, is this is a worldwide market. Digital distribution means that games can be sent anywhere in the world in the blink of an eye, and ideally the market for a video game is the world, not just one country, even as great and as big as the U.S. market is, it's not enough. I mean, these, nowadays, it's to reach farther. So one example, we do several things to make sure we're embracing that reality. One is we coordinate our policy positions with our counterparts around the world in Australia, Europe, Japan, Korea, and other places. And often, we'll lend our voice to different policy challenges they're facing in their country because it's what's necessary and right for the market to continue to thrive here. 
So we coordinate with our colleagues in the other trade associations around the world, and we do that um, several times a year. But one of the big ones coming up, of course, is E3. We have a gathering, and, um, and there's just a few thousand people joining us at that thing. But uh, it's, uh, it will have an opportunity to sit down and visit. The other thing we're doing is the international um, uh, IARC, which is Pat Vance's, the ESRB's initiative, to provide a ratings environment for mobile and tablet games all around the world. Um, and that is a huge challenge that you provide ratings in the local nomenclature, in using the local uh, symbols that are familiar on a mobile platform, not easy, these are smaller screens, and in tailoring that rating to fit the ratings environment in the country where it's being requested and where it's being um, provided. And Pat and her team work with her counterparts around the world to make this available to developers and now on Google, affecting when Pat, later, what's that? Next month, the developers will be able to use it for free to when they input and answer the questions that are there, get a rating that's usable in multiple different markets around the world. So we're doing our part, we do coordinate. It's a huge challenge, just like it is for each company that's in this industry. So with that, my time is expired. I thank you for the time to be with you today. I commend you for all the good work that you're doing and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.